So good afternoon everyone. The title of my lecture today is Jean Baudrillard's Theory of Hyperreality and Simulation. Before we deal with Baudrillard's critical project of postmodernity, let us shed light on what the term refers to. And when we discuss the main, and, and then before, that is, before we discuss the main concepts in Baudrillard's project, hyperreality and simulation, we first try to understand the relationship between postmodernism and postmodernity. Postmodernity englobes the social, economic, political, and technological advancements that have marked the transition from modern to newly organized postmodern modes of life. So, when we talk about postmodernity, we're not talking about art and culture alone, but we are talking about technological advancement, political progress, economic, and also social change. <coughs> so, it is a transition from modern to newly organized postmodern modes of life. Two, two aspects. Two aspects of postmodernity are often pinpointed. I repeat, two aspects of postmodernity are often pinpointed. Can you check, please? Two aspects of postmodernity are often pinpointed. First, the economic forces of globalization, which have boosted media and information technologies, triggering social change, and second, the rise of consumer culture and simultaneous decline of traditional classical forms of production. Remember that production and consumption were separate at the beginning, in early capitalism. They were two different economic modes. Now, economic organizations produce consumption. Postmodern capitalism produces consumers. And how do we produce consumers? We produce consumers through advertising. One example. Because we create the need, and by creating the need, then, of course, that is, we create um, segments of consumers. Bowman, Zygmunt Bowman, one of the, you know, um, very well-known critics of postmodernity, argues that the world nowadays witnesses a transition from the dominance of elite values of modernity espoused by corporate power and manifested in high culture to a postmodern flattening of hierarchies. So the hierarchies here are flattened, meaning that the social fabric is fragmented, social relations are lacking moral responsibility to underprivileged, to underprivileged social groups, who are unable to cope with, or they are already defeated by the temple of capitalistic competition. So in contrast to postmodernity, which is mainly economic, political, and cultural, the term postmodernism refers to an artistic movement in literature and cultural criticism. So when we talk about postmodernism, we are rather talking about an artistic movement in literature and cultural criticism that have superseded the modernist tradition. Postmodernism is seen as a critique to elite modernism. And when we talk about elite modernism, this is evident, if you still remember, in the Levisite tradition, speaking about intellectuals as the guardians of the cultural archive. Here I quote, Dominique Strinati, as it is cited in Don Lafay, again, key themes in media theory. 
He states five key features of the postmodern informational societies. What are these five key features? First, the collapse of the difference between culture and society. He says the importance and power of mass media and popular culture mean that they govern and shape all other forms of social relationships. They are fused together. You can hardly distinguish between the organic and the industrial. Why? Because our perceptions of the social environment are largely informed. Sorry. Sorry, it's finished. The collapse of the difference between culture and society, as I say, that's the first key feature. He says the importance and power of the mass media and popular culture mean that they govern and shape all other forms of social relationships. They are fused together. You can hardly distinguish between the organic and the industrial. Why? Because our perceptions of the social environment are largely informed by cultural representations and images transmitted in media forms. So there is a collapse of the difference between culture and society, and this collapse that is is due to the percept to our perceptions that are spoon fed by the cultural representations and images transmitted in media forms. We no longer distinguish between, that is, uh, popular culture and, if you want, culture industry. The organic and the mass culture. Second feature, zoom in in form over ingredient or the focus on the form rather than the focus on the substance. So zoom in in form over ingredient. Very easy. We ask the question here, do we consume products or do we consume images and spectacles? So when we consume a product, do we, do we really consume products or rather we consume semiotic codes? And I think this is normally where Baudrillard is very strong because he, he is speaking about that is uh, the sign uh, or that is the sign value of the product rather than just the, its use value or its exchange value. Number three, the disintegration of the boundaries between high art and popular culture in the postmodern age. This is a modernist distinction now challenged by postmodern media culture <coughs> that embraces both high art and popular culture in manufacturing and culture industry. Very hard now, that is, with postmodern, that is, with the, in a postmodern age, very hard to distinguish still between that is popular art and high art, especially when they are all commoditized in media form. Collapse of time and space dimensions. That's number four. The modes, technologies, economics and politics of communication in the global village following McLuhan's turn are distorting traditional conceptions of time and space dimensions. Look at your Facebook chat as an example, is it similar to the physical interactions within a social context? As you see, the uh, customary social context that we are familiar with collapses in its medial fall. 
or of course if we are talking about digital media or even we are talking about that is a uh, mainstream media it's the same dimensions of time and space are completely different it's not like a physical interaction where you can study different parameters of context here the context is completely different sometimes the context because the context of production could be very different from the context of reception and also that of distribution. Demand, or if you want, the gradual death, demise of grand narratives, meta narratives, grand theories such as Marxism, modernism, and many others have lost their currency for postmodern societies. It's very difficult to standardize cultures now under unitary philosophical models. The main challenge to the meta-narrative thesis is the concept of localization, based on the premise that cultures are heterogeneous and societies are fragmented. So meta-narratives should adapt themselves to local cultures and markets. If you do not understand something, please note it down. Then for the recession, we have a discussion. You should come on time, please. We are already a half of it, sorry. <clears throat> so if you do not understand something, that is, um, just note down questions, and then we raise the discussion tomorrow during the recession. Is it clear? Good. Yeah. It's within this postmodern debate that John Baudrillard, that is Baudrillard's critical project, comes forth, reconsidering the relationship between society and culture. At the center of his critique of modern and postmodern society is his notion of hyperreality. The social subject for him has gradually melted into a networked terminal. He is fed information from media sources, so his culture is a fabricated system of meaning that reduces his human participation in the world to the role of consumer or responder rather than producer and initiator. Baudrillard attempts to answer the question of how we can best understand the obscure boundaries of post-industrial information-based societies as they have been constructed along with the global and multinational forces of advanced corporate capitalism since 1945. We shouldn't forget that the flow of goods, services, images, and signs in global capitalism has created new regions and sites of shared cultural consciousness, hyper-realities, or media scapes that continuously but cryptically display the workings of new powers and new ideologies. Baudrillard's thinking clearly calls many issues of vital importance into question, including the classical images of modernity, the meta-narratives used to define and organize modernity and the substitution of simulation for production as the basis of advanced capitalist reality. To cut that is a story short and to give you examples so that you understand this theoretical you know, introduction to, Bo to Baudrillard's critical project, one of his absurd theories that you also find in Luffy's book there mentioned is when he propounds that the Gulf War didn't take place. Just remember. And he says also Disneyland is the real America. At first, these claims appear ridiculous. But as we shall see, Baudrillard's Baudrillard presents a complex argument that offers a specific interpretation of these theoretical statements. He argues that postmodern societies 
spoon fed by media and information technologies have entered an age of simulation. More particularly, an age of third order simulation. Third order simulation differs from the two earlier forms of simulation. Because Baudrillard distinguishes between three main orders of simulation. First order. First order he calls first order signification. There is a representation of the real and it is obviously artificial. Reality is constructed through representation. Example, maps, paintings, representation still maintains a relationship with reality. What does this mean here? First order, signific first order signification means that there is still a fixed sun against which to, to measure the image because when we talk about reality and representation of reality so it means that there is something genuine and authentic which is represented you understand what I mean? it means that there is representation and reality so we talk about representation of reality like maps and paintings so you map something that already exists or you paint something that already exists. Second order is reproduction. This is maybe what uh, also Walter Benjamin, uh, in German we say Walter Benjamin, in English you could also say Walter Benjamin, okay? So Walter Benjamin's um, article, the age of mechanical reproduction also speaks about this. So this evokes uh, Benjamin's age of mechanical reproduction, in that the boundary between reality and representation is blurred. <clears throat> in some sense, the representation has become as real as the thing it represents. That's the second order. Signs refer to signs which imitate real things. Representations of reality are reproduced by mechanical technologies example photography and film now we, we move to third order simulation third order simulation this is this is the postmodern hey this is the postmodern stage and i think here it is the collapse of the sun it's the collapse of the foundation, the collapse of the fixed reality. The representation precedes the real. It comes before the real. And in fact, produces it. <coughs> what it produces is not reality, but it's hyper-reality. So that's the meaning here of hyper-reality. So what will our things that it has become the that, that that this simulation has become the dominant way of understanding and experiencing the world. Signs no longer represent real real things, but serve to mask the absence of reality. There is no connection between reality and representation. Instead, we have hyper reality, like <coughs> the example of Disneyland. It's so not just a second order simulation where fake mountains look more real than real, but a third order. Disneyland stands for all of real America. Why? It is presented as an imaginary construct associating all of Los Angeles and America with the order of the hyper real and of simulation. To explain. To explain the hyper-reality of American society through the coined metaphor of Disneyland, we refer to Foucault. Prisons are in society to tell us 
that we are free, unlike prisoners who are incarcerated. But we are not. <coughs> the two social realms, prison, in prison, out of prison, are similar. <coughs> Don't you think so? We are free prisoners. In the we are free prisoners in our society. In the sense, of course, we don't bear prison numbers, but we are attributed labels and names, and our expression and conduct is under restrictions and taboos. But prisoners, it's the same model. Red lines are always there. Disciplinarity is always there. To what extent is society not a prison? <coughs> so th the prison model still exists, though the iron bars are not visible, but they could be psychological. The difference is a matter of degree, it's not a matter of nature. The Disneyland metaphor is similar in that it reminds us that both Disneyland and the rest of America share the same informational or technologized mediated imagination. So both Disneyland and the rest of America share the same informational or technologized mediated imagination. The rest of America is standardized into a Disneyland model. This is what Baudrillard means when he states that Disneyland is the real America. Because the real America is actually a hyper-real phenomenon, divorced from the once authentic real place called America. For him, it has now vanished from human experience. Let us take another example. This example is the first Gulf War. Again, the same thing from but with our 1995 and also 9-11 terrorist atrocities that also what will our speaks of or spoke about in 2002 for him again the Gulf War didn't happen because it was hyper real and virtual now you have to understand this philosophical level that Baudrillard speaks about. <coughs> because here, for you, perhaps you, you are going to be a little bit confused because you think that the Gulf War did happen, but he says that he didn't. And of course, well, we're not talking just about the physical event, but we are also talking about its effect, its impact, and how it is also conveyed and untransmitted, you know, to an international audience. That event was hyper-real for Baudrillard and virtual. The world audiences witnessed screened images of U.S. jets bombing Iraqi targets from thousands of miles above land and military operations broadcasted via CNN, Al Jazeera, and other Western media. That's what we, we've all seen. Yes or no? Good. So it was a media model war. It was a media model war. It was not a war in the sense of conflict and combat where audiences feel the fear, horror, and revulsion of war. of its casualties and collateral damage. The first two world wars rather, rather happened. The Gulf War was an, inter was an international virtual experience, much like a video game, that simulates real warfare. And therefore, this real-time media constructed spectacle is nothing other than what Baudrillard calls and non-event. For him, this is a non-event. 
Why a non-event? A non-event is not for those who are suffering on the ground. Of course, we cannot deny the casualties, the deaths, and of course, the atrocities that took place on the ground. For these people, the war was real. But it is a non-event for those who are watching the media. Such rated event, facing screens, enjoying the simulated video game of U.S. to the Fox. Subsequent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were directed in a simulated manner with an overflow of military forces, false propaganda, bogus information. Remember, think of the example of Iraq. What happened to the weapons of mass destruction that Iraq was supposed to possess? They didn't exist. That's bogus information. Senseless offensives, emotive and deceitful language, technological deployment and brainwashing, like the Gulf War, a non-event of the order of the hyperreal took place. This theory of hyperreality may also be applied to what is now happening in Syria. Very good. In Syria as well. Another event, another event worth mentioning in this context is 9-11. This was an act of terrorist violence that has exchanged symbolic meanings for the Americans. And it was real. It was real for the Americans because the media were part of the event, part of the terror, constructing moral panic in American society. According to Bodhmila, the architectural object was destroyed, the buildings, but it was the symbolic object which was targeted and which it was intended to demolish not one, not even the terrorists had reckoned on the total destruction of the towers. The aim of the terrorists was to show the terrorism of spectacle as opposed to the spectacle of terrorism. But this Manhattan disaster movie was not a real event, it was not a real event for those who witnessed it on television because it looked like a media model of action films. The fascination of the attack is primarily a fascination with the image. And the image consumes the event in the sense that it absorbs it and offers it for consumption. So those who watch the event on TV, they're not like the, the ones who have been suffering on the ground. Two different levels of reality. Of course, the effect of powerful imagery, of course, this is the criticism we can level to Baudrillard, really the effect of powerful imagery should not, that is, uh, prompt us to neglect that 9-11 is, is not just a hyper-real event, but also a turning point in contemporary history, especially if we, if we see the events that were to follow. A complete change, you know, in foreign policy, in American foreign policy, and also uh, a reshuffling of geographical maps or geopolitical maps worldwide, not only in the Middle East, but also that is in some parts in Asia. Hyperreality by Baudrillard is the outcome of simulated imagery. What Baudrillard calls simulacrum. In this respect, Fisk maintains that the simulacrum denies not reality, but the difference between the image and the real. There is no difference between the image and other orders of experience. In this sense, Los Angeles is identified by its body of media images and cultural myths 
more so than it is a real material geographical location. We have nothing real to believe in except hyperreal simulation and simulacrum. Paul Patin recounts a queer incident when the news channel CNN switched to a group of reporters live in the Gulf. Another example. Yeah. That Paul Patin recounts CNN uh, switched to a group of reporters live in the Gulf during uh, that is uh, its reporting of the events <coughs> that took place there. The joke, the joke is that the reporters in Iraq were also watching CNN <coughs> to find out what was going on. It was an absurd moment, announcing our divorce from the real and the production of reality with a third order simulation. News is generated by news. Or the source of the news is also the news. So technologies, especially television, have collapsed the distinction between the real, the physical, terrestrial habitat and the metaphysical knowledge beyond this habitat. So, Baudrillard compares the postmodern subject, and this is the image he gives, to an astronaut in his capsule at the controls of a microsatellite in orbit, living no longer as an actor or dramaturge, but as a terminal of multiple networks. <coughs> so, for Baudrillard, we are networked terminals. Okay? Computer, okay, networked terminals. You know, terminal in computer industry. <coughs> so, terminals like set, that is, a computer sets or these uh, posts, and then looks, that is, these terminals. In a network, they receive information from different media sources. So that's another that is a, that's another metaphor. The problem is that he never defines, he never gives a theory of this, you know, subject position. It's not clear. But that is, you know, that is, but that's the metaphor he uses for our social existence. We are now that is, we are no longer social constructs, rather. We are networked terminals because of this, <coughs> that is, of this spoon feed in, or because of this informational society we live in, and it keeps, you know, feeding its information, its media information from different sources, that is, into our minds. Isn't this similar to the passive consumer? Paradigm to some extent. Though, of course, for Baudrillard, we will see later, this distinction between passive and active also collapses. In the same vein, Bowman states that there is no foundation reality left to test representations against. For Baudrillard, Society itself is now made to the measure of television. One can no longer speak of the distortion of reality. There is nothing left to measure the image against. No fixed reality or no fixed foundation to measure this image against. Representations, it's like, it's like this, this migratory signifier by Derrida. Signifier leads on to signifier, leads on to signifier, ad infinitum. Here we have a similar thing with representations. Representations lost, you know, that is, uh, uh, that is, uh, in, uh, that is in, 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 that is in a universe that is ad infinitum, that is without any source or without any fixed center. 
One can no longer speak of the distortion of reality. There is nothing left to measure the image against. Look at mediated advertising and its omnipresence invading every space, public and private alike. Harassing audiences with obscene simulations, a whole pornography of information and communication, but will I say it, or what he calls the, ex the ecstasy of communication. In his early works, Jean Baudrillard sought to elaborate a new political economy of the sign, based on a Marxist critique of the commodity form. Baudrillard was convinced that Marx's analysis of use value and exchange value had been completely old-fashioned in modern times regulated by monopoly capital. With the high technology of production, capitalism moves from the production of goods and services to the production of semiotic codes and images to supply the need of customers. So it's not here, that is, production is moving from that is the use value and exchange value of products to their semiotic or sign value. Remember, to, that is, uh, to explain to you this, remember what we said at the beginning, we said that in early capitalism, production and consumption were separate. <clears throat> they, were, they were two separate chains. In the sense that we didn't need to create that, that need in order that is uh, we didn't need to create that need in order to build um, that is uh, a community of consumers or to target a segment of consumers. Economy that is produces uh, uh, that is goods out of use, practicality, and that is uh, what people need to use in their social life or the, in their daily life. Now, things have changed, that is, with the appearance of advertising. Remember that advertising invades every space in our lives. It creates needs in people, in consumers. Even if the things you do not need them, advertising that is, pushes you, that is, towards that particular need. So you no longer shop out of, that is, usefulness, but out of desire. And this is why products, so what is now the value of products? It is the sign attributed to them. It is the semiotic meaning attributed to them. That is what is important. That's why we are moving from not only the use value and exchange value, but also we are moving to the semiotic value. We consume, that is, that is, we consume images, we consume signs, we consume meanings. Not only we consume what we need. Well, you, you know, there is a look at just your, um, look at a trivial example in your social life. For instance, take the example of pairs of shows that you have at home. Count them. How many? Why do we have all these pairs of shows at home and we just use only two or three for the year? Yes, well, if we are going to shop out of use value or exchange value, then perhaps two or three are enough, or even one. There are people that is, we do not have the, that is, the, the wherewithals to buy shoes, so they keep only one pair per year or per two years. And they keep repairing that pair whenever, you know, it gets worn out. What does this mean here? That explains exactly, you know, this value that is added by the semiotic codes and images 
that is that, that we supply customers need with. Therefore, the focus in our understanding of commodity fetishism today must shift from exchange values to sign values invested in products, from cash nexus to the nexus of symbols, or image and symbolic coding. Since these modes of coding add value to commodities today, it's now the sign exchange value which is fundamental. In short, we consume images and symbols. And also, as you know, as Weber says, we also consume to mark status. That's why you find people, they don't buy the same brand of cars. Each one has a particular preference, depending again on how he has inculcated, you know, the media information about cars. And also about the status of the car, you know, in the market and also that is in society. In elaborating the logic of hyperreality, Baudrillard draws a distinction between the historical polarization in early capitalism between capital and labor, <coughs> production and consumption, supply and demand. <coughs> Traditionally, Capital only had to produce goods, that's what I said, and consumption ran by itself. Transnational corporate planning explores new markets and produces new consumers, or produces consumers now. It produces demand. And this production is infinitely more costly than that of goods. Advertising is one of the thriving businesses nowadays that produce demands and produce consumers. That is a uh, hyper-reality, uh, if I go back again, uh, that is um, over this idea. Hyper-reality that is now um, challenges this, the traditional distinctions between or the historical polarization in early capitalism between capital and labor, production and consumption, supply and demand, all these distinctions collapse. Because in the is in this transnational corporate planning, production and consumption are interwoven. We produce products and we produce consumers at the same time. But we now further argues that social fabrics or societies or, or, or social structures are manufactured to sustain consumption. So our social fabrics are constructed to sustain, to uphold consumption in the sense that every dimension of our social existence today is essentially a complex simulation of reality, designed specifically to sustain the fragile cycles of political, economic, and cultural reproduction. Well, that's a little bit announcing, you know, a society of consumers, or consumerism in society. Individual desires are surveyed and obstructed into prepackaged needs. We keep always making market research about what people need. And then you prepackage this into needs, and then these become productive forces of the market, which explains how people are socially constructed into consumers, technologized and commoditized in mediated packages of desires to serve the interests of the market. Today, the word social mass is a little bit, you know, very ambiguous because it is neither a subject nor an object. It bears no relation to any historical social reference. It's not a class, it's not a nation, it's not a folk, 
but it's not the populace. Instead, it is a mere numerical unit whose only prints appear in social surveys or opinion polls. The silent majorities of the masses are no longer representable in political terms or concretely identifiable in social terms. These silent majorities, these masses now, it's very hard now that is to that is to explore them in terms of political or social parameters. They are rather counted as figures and numbers and percentages in audience market research. So that is, our social existence is determined by our consumption. But with our parodies, here McLuhan's, if you still remember, McLuhan's theory, the medium is the message. He parodies, you know, to parody, that is, that is uh, to imitate in a very sarcastic way. Suggesting so the mass and the media are the same process today. And, of course, he says, instead of saying the message is the message, he says the mass is the message. But, of course, the mass, and put age between quotes, then he keeps the word mass here. The mass, okay, he is the message. You understand? That's the parody. Okay? The mass. Okay. Mass meaning that is the, the mass culture, mass, uh, that is the mass of consumers. Given this fact, the historical resistance of the masses to social control by capital and the state is now turning to hyper conformity. So for him, that is um, the historical resistance to power, to corporate power, and the state now turns into what he calls hyperconformity. And I will explain it later. And what does it mean, hyperconformity, for him? I will, that is, detail it later, but I give you here, um, that is, um, a, a succinct or brief, that is, um, definition of hyperconformity. This radical activity for the masses boils down to tactics of consumerist overuse, overconsumption. You want us to consume? Okay, let's consume. Always, and more, and anything whatsoever, for any useless and absurd purpose. And then you expand Capitalism to its limits. That is what Baudrillard Baud speaks about. And I'll explain that in a bit. For Baudrillard, Baud media, technology, and message content are no longer real because the genuine real distinction between them is lost. And what keeps in media representation of these distinctions that is, and what keeps in media representation of these distinctions. So for him, there is the distinction between technology and content is no longer visible. These are two, or if you want, these are, um, if you want, different orders of simulation, or different levels of simulation. Media saturates the boundaries, if not construct them. Again, we are back again to McLuhan's, that is, medium is the message. So far as technology saturates that is, the, that is these boundaries, if not it constructs them even, therefore it's very hard to make a distinction between that is what is message or what is even technology. There are some fundamental differences between Baudrillard and McLuhan, often understated. One critic, I quote here, Merin, he argues 
that McLuhan's focus on the power of technological form over content is counteracted by Baudrillard's theory of simulation, which emphasizes the sign form, not technological form. So if McLuhan has put emphasis on, that is, on the technological form, Baudrillard has rather put you know, emphasis on the sign form, that is, of the media product. Baudrillard's claim that media power abolishes social relations and transforms individuals into network terminals is far less optimistic than McLuhan's version, which is closer to theories of progressive information society. So I think that when Baudrillard tells us that we are mere network terminals, this is a very pessimistic, you know, theory of the subject because we are at the mercy of media technology or that is media organizations. But Milan's theory doesn't account for the traditional resistance in the sense of opposite decoding in a particular social context. We don't have to, there is, you don't have to, um, you don't have to, there is, um, <clears throat> you have to make a distinction between Baudrillard's theory of resistance and the cultural studies, you know, theory of resistance based on decoding, because decoding still, that is, um, is an active, um, uh, it's, it is an active position of the, that is of the decoder or of the audience, and they have they develop a little bit their own interpretative frameworks. Here, Baudrillard speaks about another type of, of resistance. It is a resistance from within, it's not a resistance from without. Baudrillard's theory doesn't account for the traditional resistance in the sense of opposite decoding in a particular social context. Rather, everything is redirected into the spectacular, entertainment and floating of information without resistance. But Rilard claims that the growth of modernity is conditioned by the progress of informational modes of production. A new reality logic based on simulation rather than representation constitutes the dominant organizing principle of this new era. So for him, now the predominant logic, that is, that there is a, the predominant reality logic now is based on simulation and not on representation. Therefore, McLuhan's formula, the medium is the message, appropriately is the key formula of the era of simulation. The medium is the message, the sender is the receiver. The masses no longer act as traditional historical subjects in the social political context. They cast an immense shadow as the silent majorities that diffuse and deflect the trajectories of corporate power and state of origin. For Baudrillard, simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being, or a substance. It's the production by models of a real without origin or reality. So now we create the beings here. What is hyperreality? What is the simulation? It is the production by models. We create by models, not by reality. We create by models of a real without origin or reality. A hyperreal. So the territory no longer precedes the map, nor survives it. Henceforth, it is the map that precedes the territory. Precession, that is, precession of simulacra. It is the map that engenders 
the territory. What does this mean here? <coughs> Take the example of the Gulf War, when it was screened, that is, on CNN or on Western media. It was a, a war media model, or a, or a media model of war. The way it was screened, it followed the model. So hyper-reality is incarnated in electronic media production because in this realm, the traditional notions of causality, angle of vision, and reasoning are undermined completely by the electronic means of information. They, because in, in, in social media, the difference between cause and effect is effaced. Ends and means, subject and object, active and passive, all these, distinction, these distinctions are effaced. <coughs> they collapse in hyper-reality. Look, look at when you post something on Facebook and there are people who are, that is, um, that is uh, they interact with you. How can you apply the distinction there between active and passive? Who are the active and who are the passive? You understand what I mean? And especially if you look at active and passive in its classical, traditional distinction, you need to redefine the whole concept. All the whole concepts need, you know, redefinition. That's, that's what, you know, that's what hyper-reality, you know, faces us with. The redefinition of this media state. Simulation trespasses the distinctions of space and time. Facebook again, uh, just I bring Facebook because I know that you are Facebookers, so you are close to this example. It goes beyond the distinctions of space and time. Sender and receiver, medium and message, expression and content, as the media produce new hyperspaces with no sense of place. On such media scapes, difference evaporates, and the distinction between poles can no longer be maintained. There is a collapsing of the two traditional poles into one another. All these poles that you've heard, sender, receiver, active, passive, they found them. They collapse. They cannot be maintained. There is a collapsing of the two traditional poles in one, into one another. An absorption, or what Baudrillard calls implosion of meaning. This is where simulation begins. When one enters into simulation, <coughs> the distinction of active and passive is imploded. The last section is what kind of criticism can we level at Baudrillard's model? <laughs> What kind of criticism can we level at Baudrillard? Baudrillard's major flaw is mistaking a handful of incipient developments or nascent trends in media for a full-fledged or completely fixed new social order. We cannot deny the existence of reality, still, despite the fact that there is this rising, you know, trends in media and developments of, techno of, of media technology, but still, they cannot replace, you know, the existing social order. The world is not yet hyper-real, <coughs> all of it. The world is not yet hyper-real, all of it. In other words, the tenacity of reality between quotes or modernity 
in several spheres of everyday life still overshadows hyperreality. Can this model by Baudrillard be applicable to the mountaineers of the Atlas in Morocco? No. Well, they still have a space there where they experience the real more than they experience the hyperreal. Like what we said about Chomsky again, Baudrillard tends to theorize from a particular model of media. Again, that's another problem. Like Chomsky, he theorizes from a particular model. And of course, remember that he has the American model that is, um, that is um, as a starting point. Can we say that we have totally broken? Now we are asking this question again to Baudrillard. Can we say that we have totally broken with all past forms of social relations? Huh? Have we broken with all the past forms of social relations? How can we verify this either from within or from outside of Baudrillard's, you know, framework? Baudrillard's concept of resistance, again, is very debatable. It comes from within the theoretical framework of simulation. He suggests that resistance should come from the very theoretical framework of simulation. He thinks, he thinks that the power of consumption will one day outgrow the power of production. It will expand it beyond its limits and then abolish it. He calls the masses to recognize that the exploitative capitalistic system can be abolished if pushed into a hyperlogic. This shift in his thinking raises important questions. If the social order of simulation is not real, now if we follow Baudrillard's thinking and we consider that the social order of simulation is not real, how can it be transformed by mass resistance? How can it be transformed if it's not real, powerful and productive? Another question, if the history of power and production has ended, as he says, then why does Baudrillard think that today's best radical opposition is to capital and the state? Why does he suggest hyperconformity again? He suggests hyperconformity by pushing the system into a hyperlogical practice of itself as a strategy of resistance to provoke the crisis that might abolish it. But will our strategy of hyperconformity as a means of radical resistance doesn't seriously challenge the consumerist modes of domination inherent in transnational corporate capitalism. How there is, in other words, how can hyperconformity challenge the transnational corporate capitalism? The economy of multinationals or the economic investments of multinationals. Especially that this hyperconformity is vague. It doesn't address parameters of gender, class, ethnicity, language, even ecology. Hyperconformity of whom and who? And who is this segment of audience that are concerned with hyperconformity? Baudrillard incorporates everything into the category of seduction. Coins another concept, seduction. Well, of course, based on, remember, this prepackaged desires of consumers. A category that totally subsumes such complex factors as power, production, sex, economy, they're all jump-packed into one universal force. While Baudrillard makes these claims, he never really demonstrates how this all works. 
with carefully considered evidence. He never explains how seduction works with carefully considered evidence. He theorizes, you know, about the infusion of all these into one force. But how does this work in practice? That's the question. How can we apply it as a model? Baudrillard's definition of the postmodern subject as network terminal is not clear again. He doesn't have a theory of the subject. His definition of the postmodern subject as network terminal is not a clear social identity definition either at the individual or mass level, which makes it difficult to imagine a solution to the political contradictions of hyperreality. He does not seem to have a theory of the subject position, as I say. Institutional mechanisms, group relations, huh? political conflicts, all these still need to be defined much more closely. No moral political criteria are elaborated for transforming the simulation regime into some more satisfying system of human organization. That is, um, he doesn't give any clear moral political criteria for the transformation of this simulation order or simulation regime into some satisfying system of human organization. Despite all these weaknesses, Baudrillard's critical project bears a new lantern, opening up a new avenue of research, exploring the relationship between media and reality. And even with its flaws, this theoretical framework is still instructive for developing fresh insights into the workings of power and politics within um, information-based systems as they develop hyper-real tendencies in their cultures and societies. Thank you very much. So I think there is, um, we have three questions, three main questions here. Your friend is asking the question about the relationship between reality and simulation in a postmodern age especially that is in an age of globalization. And of course, your friend wants us to go back again on clarifying the three orders of simulation. And then that is, um, we explain hyperconformity and how can we consider hyperconformity as, as radical resistance. Um, first of all, that is, apart from what Bob Willar says about reality, the relationship between reality and simulation, I want, first of all, to stop a little bit and contemplate with you this, this, um, this concept of reality and ask the question whether even reality exists and how we understand reality. Now, if you are looking for a genuine, authentic reality, or a reality with a capital R, either that is um, um, either in a global age or before. Therefore, you are that is it's a figment of imagination, because reality doesn't exist. We cannot just say reality doesn't exist and then it's full stop. Reality doesn't exist because um, reality uh, uh, that is. Um, Ever since the appearance of structuralism, the works of Ferdinand de Saussure, Levi Strauss, and many other structuralists, language becomes a mediator of reality. So we did that is uh, before people used to think that reality, that is that thought and language were separate, they were independent. They existed separately. And so people can think outside language. 
with the appearance of structuralism and especially the works of, that is, of, as I say, of Ferdinand de Saussure and David Strauss, and later semiologists, it has been now a well-known chestnut that language mediates reality, that reality is shaped by language. And language, of course, is imbued with ideologies, with beliefs and values. It's not an innocent public institution. So reality and language, they are interwoven. So that's why it's very hard to speak about a reality outside language. Can we have access to reality outside language? And when we say language, it's not only verbal. We mean it, that is, we mean all types of sign systems. Here, yeah. we are using language in its philosoph that is, as a philosophical term, that is, to connote different types of communication systems. So, reality with a capital R doesn't exist. There are many realities, with many versions, many representations. And so even this fixed, as I say, this uh, fixed uh, foundation will disappear with post-structuralist thinking. And I think that Baudrillard is one of these thinkers of the structuralist and post-structuralist paradigm. It's the death of the source, or the death, or the death of the center. That's why when Derrida speaks about migration of the signifier, he doesn't, that is, uh, it's, it's the collapse of the, of the center. There is no fixed center against which you can measure, you know, the revolving, the revolving signs or the revolving signifiers. Even, this, even that distinction between signifier and signified, in Derrida, signifier becomes a signifier, and that leads to another signifier ad infinitum. It's a chain, you know, of signification that he calls, you know, difference. So, simulation for the that is for simulation for Baudrillard, for Baudrillard that, that is not in language, this is in media, it's in media forum, which is another type of language here. He speaks about representations transmitted, that is transmitted to us all in their media forms. So for him, we exist in a world controlled, that is, by simulation, more than it, it is controlled by fixed realities. So the social order is made up of different types of simulations. And when, we, when you depart from, or when you cut with one order, one social order of simulation, you fall within the grip of another. Of course, if you talk about religion, that religion, it will be a certainty for you. It's not an order of simulation. But, you know, from that is this perspective that Baudrillard sees the world, that is all of the information that we get, that is, is, that is, um, uh, it, it is, um, that is, it is an order of simulation. It is a representation of reality. Now, what makes it simulation is the technology. It's the network. It's the medium. Again, following McLuhan's term, medium is the message. And to understand this relationship better, we go over again the uh, 
the three orders explained by Baudrillard. He speaks about the first order, which is signification. And what does he say about signification? He says there is a representation of the real, and it is obviously artificial. Well, again, this is as if he's historicizing the development of our mind, our thinking. So before, people used to think that there is a fixed reality, and there is representation of reality. And one is the imitation of the other. So, that, because that, remember that uh, ever since Plato, we used to, there is, uh, what was the, what was the, uh, the dominant mode? What was the dominant relationship between reality and fiction? My missus. Imitation. Okay? Imitation of reality. Now even, and when we moved from, there is, uh, after that we moved from imitation to representation. Okay? From the age of imitation to the age of representation. Now we are moving from the age of representation, according to Baudrillard, to the age of simulation, hyper-reality, which means that we, well, there is a, nothing is real. Nothing is real because our production, our cultural production follows models. We eat, we drink, we dress, and we behave according to models, media models. Actors, actresses, footballers, huh? What are these models for us? Remember that the models in the past, they were not models of consumption. Models of the past were inventors, scientists. They were models of production, not models of consumption. Now, Missy could be a model. He is. Yeah, of course. You understand what I mean? And so if he wears something or if he does a hairstyle, everybody follows. And so reality is simulation to some extent. That's why he say it's 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 not it's not Disneyland, I would say Disneylandization. You understand? Like McDonaldization again of society. So the first order, signification, this there is representation of the real, I mean it's obviously artificial. Reality is constructed through representation. Example maps, paintings, representations still maintained a relationship with reality. Second order is reproduction. This evokes, as I say, Benjamin's age of mechanical reproduction. Here, the, 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 the relationship between representation and reality is blurred. Good. Signs refer to signs which imitate real things. Representations of reality are reproduced by me mechanical technologies. Think of films, photography, all of this shows this kind of mechanical reproduction. So here, that's an age, or that's a phase where the, there is the boundaries between representation and reality are a little bit confused. They are blurred. But the third order, that's an, that's an order of simulation. It means reality is lost. It no longer exists as a point of reference or as a unit of reference. We no longer refer to reality, you know, as a fixed foundation to define that is the hyperreal. But the hyperreal exists independently as a particular social order. There is, 
hyperconformity. This is um, a, that is uh, this is a tactics of, as we said, of consumerist overuse or overconsumption. In the sense that you expand the logic of of consumption to its extreme, to a hyper logic of consumption. You want us to consume? Let's consume. Consume whatever. Always and more and anything whatsoever, useless and for any absurd purpose. This way, that is, this hyperconformity that is, may create a crisis for capitalism that may lead to its downfall if we go to, towards experiencing the limits of consumption in the capitalistic enterprise. What it is radical, it is radical in the sense that it is hedonistic. It is radical in the sense that it is hedonistic, it is irresponsible then. But radical not in the sense that it is, of course, um, that is um, um, uh, a voice of opposition aware of the operation of power and, that is in, in, in control of capital. Thank you.